Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer, with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. We are back yet again, and today we're, uh, you know, it's it's starting to be a little bit warmer outside. It's nicer than it has been, so not that we can go outside or anything, but hopefully all of you at home are having nicer days. Maybe you'll get a little bit of a chance to enjoy at least standing outside for a second or two. With that, I was going to transition, I suppose, into our conversation of the day by previewing it a little bit in that we're going to talk a little bit about how lawyers do business. Uh, We often think of lawyers as professionals and practitioners, which obviously they are, but for many lawyers, and one could argue all lawyers, being able to be the master of the business side is critical. And it's one of those areas that maybe we didn't know we wanted to handle or be a part of when we went into this profession, but it's a reality. I mean, sometimes you just have to be on top of the revenue that's coming in and, you know, and also on top of the costs that are going out. Which brings me to the question, are you trying to cut costs? Because you're not alone. In today's climate, a five-figure e-discovery bill per month is steep. Don't pay that. Use Logical to reduce expenses and control your discovery process. Get started today for only $250 per matter, and they'll waive migration costs from competing platforms. For more information, visit Logical.com slash LTN. That's Logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash LTN. That took a little bit of work to try and make that seem like that was natural, but uh, hopefully I pulled it off for the rest of you. But yeah, we are going to talk about business development, and that's why our guest today is with us. Uh, David Ackert from the Market Leaders Podcast is going to talk, we're going to, we're just going to chat about the business side for a little bit. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Joe. Great to be here. Yeah. So I guess what you do have a podcast, so let's, uh, let's begin with the podcast kind of cross promotion. So, you know, obviously everyone listening knows us. Tell us a little bit about your podcast and what you cover over there. Sure. So the Market Leaders podcast has been around for a couple of years now. We typically will interview business leaders and thought leaders around the topics of marketing and business development, uh, primarily in the legal sector. So we'll bring in chief marketing officers, we'll bring in consultants, and the topics that we talk about range from uh, how to develop business in the current climate, which obviously it's gotten a little harder than it might have been four or five months ago. Oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in case you hadn't noticed, there there have been some changes lately. Um, but we'll also bring in people who will talk about uh, institutional business development initiatives within larger firms or uh, how to motivate lawyers to think more uh, around their sort of business development mindset, orient themselves around how to uh, keep key relationships top of mind for smaller firms. I mean, there really is quite the gamut that we go through. Yeah, you know, I in my intro, I kind of hit on something that I, I just hadn't thought of, but it, it, as the words escape my lips, I thought about it, which is we think of lawyers and business development as kind of the province of somebody who runs a firm, maybe the province of a partner. Uh, But it's it's really something that it, at all levels of being a lawyer, you have to kind of think about the business side, even uh, even as you start out. And so that's why a podcast like this that that talks about the from different perspectives how business works is kind of so critical. And I hadn't really thought about that. I only, you know, like I mean, it's how we always are. We always think of the the business side as something that the rainmaker worries about, but it's not true. It's it's kind of always there for you. Well, I think especially lately, um, and when I say lately, I guess what I mean is the last 10 years since the economic downturn, there's been a recognition across the industry that uh, the model of, well, there's the rainmaker or there's the group of rainmakers and, you know, they sort of feed everybody else. Uh, That model is no longer one that you can rely upon. If your rainmaker is, you know, lateraled out of your firm or they retire or, um, you know, whatever, something happens that 
kind of jeopardizes that revenue stream, uh, then the rest of the firm is very vulnerable. So I think lawyers are starting to recognize that uh, everybody has to dip an oar into the water on this boat and do what they can. Now, some are obviously more capable or more interested than others in developing business. But at the end of the day, your practice is your practice. And you can't expect other people to uh, take responsibility for its growth if you won't. Yeah. And and you mentioned people lateraling or retiring. And that's why it's worth it, uh, even if you're out there listening to this and you're a law student or young associate saying, well, then maybe this is something I want to learn about down the road. It, it, learning the best practices and building relationships and understanding how they work, something you may want to start doing now, because at a certain point, somebody's going to leave and it's going to be on you to retain that business and build upon it. So these are all lessons yeah. that are timely. Let me, uh, let me dive into that just a little bit, yeah. if I may, Joe, because yeah. I want to make sure that we aren't sort of um, speaking at such a high and broad level that it just becomes overwhelming to someone who's perhaps earlier in their career. So if you think about it sort of like a, a funnel, right? When you're at the early stage of your career, you're at the top of the funnel, and you're really looking at producing as many connections and relationships as you can at that point. You know, whoever has the broadest network really wins at that level, simply because the people who are in that demographic are not yet decision makers. They're not yet people who can engage your services in any meaningful way. And candidly, you're probably not at a stage yet where you can command the level of authority that you'll be able to as you near partner level uh, in your career, right? So this is uh, the time when you want to cast a, a wide net. And so no one is expecting you to bring in any business at that point in time, but there is an expectation, and it's just sort of you know, smart business, smart networking, to keep in touch with the people you know who you've met in law school, the people who you knew in maybe your undergraduate work, the people who with whom you've developed good relationships. Don't let those relationships atrophy, because five or 10 years from now, you're really going to be glad that you've kept in touch with them as some of them, not all. That's why we're talking about a funnel here. Some of them are just sort of going to stay at the top end of that sort of framework, if you will. But as you move through your career, uh, there's going to be a short list that emerges. And these are the people who are now in a position to engage your services or refer your services. And it's a little awkward to reach out to them and say, hey, I know I haven't talked to you in 10 years since law school, but you know, I'm up for partner. Or I just became partner and suddenly I have to do business development. That's a really uh, awkward way to, to sort of rekindle a relationship, right? So you want to uh, maintain those relationships as you're moving through those early stages in your career so that they're going to be there for you uh, when you need them. Yeah. So you know, one of the things I've kind of previewed is that lawyers, you know, it, well, I mean, we talk about technology and uh, lawyers not being able to understand that a lot. But it's also true that lawyers often struggle with that business side of it. It's not what, you know, they did. We went to law school because we were told there would be no math. All of that business side is just a different skill set than what I think a lot of people went into law school thinking they were going to do. So with lawyers not always being the best at it, why do you think lawyers have this, these sorts of struggles? Sure. Well, there's been a lot of research on this. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with or if you, you've had Dr. Larry Richard on this show before, but he's a, a psychologist who has, he's also a JD and he's studied the psychology of lawyers for many decades. And in Dr. Richard's findings, there are four key personality traits that set lawyers apart from the general population. And he's um, identified this through what he calls the calipers personality profiling, which is essentially a personality test that he's run on thousands of lawyers now over the years. And these four key personality traits include urgency. So that is to say lawyers have a higher sense of urgency than the average person. Uh, they're very results oriented. They seek efficiency and economy, often at the cost of innovation or process. And they can be perceived as impatient or brusque or as poor listeners. You know, if you're in an environment where you're being billed and, you know, you're billing in six minute increments and efficiency is, you know, one of the values that not only your clients appreciate, but internally at your firm is, heralded as, as being a priority, of course, it's going to feed into that, that characteristic and that behavior. Um, the second characteristic is autonomy. 
So lawyers tend to be people who approach challenges on their own time, their own terms. They're more comfortable being in a position of advisor than learner. There tends to be that lone wolf syndrome that can emerge. And so people who are attracted to the practice of law have a much higher autonomy characteristic than the average person. But when it comes to resilience, the ability to sort of try new things uh, and you know keep going back to the drawing board, so to speak, and sociability to show emotional vulnerability and build new relationships, lawyers rank much lower than the general public. So these four characteristics make a lot of sense in the context of practicing law, but they are particularly challenging when it comes to developing business. You know, someone who wants to develop business and create a, a robust professional network and be able to uh, compel another to engage their services, they're going to do poorly if they have too high a sense of urgency because business development development is a long game. It takes years to convert a relationship into a client. And if they have a high sense of autonomy, they're going to have a hard time cross-selling or working as a team, creating a client team within their firm. Uh, if they have a low sense of resilience, then, you know, business development is nothing if it isn't a matter of uh, trying over and over again to find opportunities where someone can become your client. And sometimes you reach out to them and they say no. And if you're too thin skinned about it, then you might not go back later when the answer could have been yes. And of course, sociability, it all comes down to relationships. So these are um, ways where the people who tend to be attracted to the practice of law find themselves at a, at a disadvantage. Now, of course, there are the rainmakers, those outliers who just have it in their DNA, but uh, they're in a, a, a very small pool of the population when it comes to the legal profession. And so other lawyers have to sort of find their way through this uphill uh, battle that is, you know, as you point out, not necessarily what they signed up for when they went to law school. Yeah, I mean, I, I practiced in white collar, so I tried to I tried to meet as many criminal people as I could at all times. Cause, no, <laughs> I'm no, sure it um, had nothing to do with your extracurricular activities. Right, yeah, no. Um, but so, you know, we, we mentioned the, you mentioned the financial crisis, and I guess now we've, we've got another one, uh, so maybe we should say the, the last financial crisis. But have you noticed that there's been an uptick or anything in lawyers' interests in reaching out and getting help on this sort of stuff since that's happened uh, as the, maybe like the old, uh, like kind of like the old movie studio system that as with the financial crisis that maybe some of those old models have broken down a bit and people are more interested in learning. Yeah, I wouldn't call it an uptick. I'd call it a surge. I mean, okay. uh, you know, at my company, we provide business development coaching and training, and we have uh, software programs that uh, we license into law firms. And so not only are we seeing this in terms of uh, lawyers really registering in droves for our webinars that provide techniques where they can learn how to develop business more effectively, either in general or specific to the COVID landscape. But also on our software platforms, we see the spike in the data. They, you know, they're logging in more now. They're looking at how they can manage their relationships more aggressively than they have before. And I think it just comes with the anxiety of, you know, uh, I just don't know what to expect now. Before COVID, things were pretty predictable. You know, there, there's, there, I have a good base of clients and they're going to call with needs and they're going to do it at a fair fairly regular clip and, you know, sure, I can be proactive and grow my practice or I can just coast along and I still have a pretty good practice. I mean, that's one of the good things about being a lawyer is that once you get to a certain position in your career, there's quite a bit of stability in this industry. But I think that that assurance that things are going to uh, move in a predictable uh, fashion has really been taken away from lawyers in the last few months. And so we are seeing lawyers get a lot more, I would say, anxious, I would say proactive, uh, and I would ultimately say on some level, um, a little healthier when it comes to thinking about um, business development, simply because uh, to the extent that one rests on one's laurels, even in the best of times, uh, they're not going to be able to harness the full potential of their practice. So you mentioned software and tools. I think for some folks, it might be hard to wrap their heads around what what kind of a program helps me have a connection with somebody. You know, I, I go to a baseball game with them. I get that. What What is it about software that makes that work? So it's kind of that client relations management stuff. Can you explain to folks how that 
all works. Sure. Well, I think, you know, software is not going to help you deepen a connection with another person, but it is going to help you with the uh, primary challenge that lawyers have with business development, which is not so much proclivity. It's really follow through. It's follow up, right? I mean, the, lawyers have friends who they're comfortable talking to no matter how introverted they may be. And so it's not a matter of, well, I just don't want to talk to anyone, right? It's usually that I have a very short list of people uh, with whom I'm comfortable being sociable. And I just don't want to go out there and schmooze and, you know, be a serial networker and, and expand that network. But I'm fine talking to this short list of people, clients, maybe colleagues at the firm, maybe some referral sources. Um, the challenge is that they just get so busy managing a busy practice, the administrative burden that comes along with it, never mind the billable hour requirements, that these relationships sort of fall through the cracks. And suddenly a lawyer picks up their head and says, wow, I've, I've been, you know, neck deep in this case or this trial or what have you. And I haven't been very good at reaching out to the people in my network who make the biggest difference to the growth of my practice. So they end up in kind of this reactive dynamic, right? Where if someone emails them or calls them with a need, certainly they're responsive to that, but they're only servicing the matters that fall in their lap for the most part. So very reactive. The lawyers that are more proactive are ones who uh, are using some sort of system and maybe it's old school and it's just an Excel spreadsheet or it's a paper list somewhere. But there are also software platforms that'll send you a tickler, a reminder, hey, you know, you really ought to reach out to Mary. You haven't talked to her in three months. And, you know, you put her into the software as a key relationship. And so the software that we have is called Practice Pipeline, and, and it really helps lawyers manage that short list. It's not a CRM database with everybody and their mother, you know, and all of their phone numbers and all that stuff in it. It's just who are the most important relationships to my practice and how do I make sure that I'm keeping keeping them top of mind so that those relationships don't uh, end up going dormant. Yeah, no, they, it's just one of those, you know, I, I, we back to the technology thing. I, I feel as though lawyers don't understand how technology works when it's the obvious stuff sometimes. So the, the kind of non-obvious, this is here to help you understand, you know, the, the connections that you yourself have, right? Like it, you brought that connection into the process, the, the software is there to help you understand that you have it, uh, to kind of respect what you've already accomplished. That's as, right. Yeah. To manage an existing asset, if you will. Yeah. Well, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is kind of the flip side. We talked about people lateraling and retiring. And there was a an era that came up the, for years where firms were a collection of fiefs uh, in a lot of ways where I, you know, I have the relationship with this client and somebody else has this relationship. So how do you kind of balance that uh, in the, as you're seeing, uh, talking to people in the industry, how is that getting balanced between the firm who has an interest in cross-promoting clients and spreading it out through all of the different vectors that they can service. Mm -hmm. And the attorneys who have a very real business interests, especially in this world where people are getting laid off and so on, in being very proprietary about their own relationships. Uh, and how does that play out? I don't know if you, this kind of more of a general, what have you heard as you've talked to market leaders over the years? Sure. Well, it's funny you're asking this question because um, I just conducted a poll on a webinar that I was running this morning uh, with, there were about 140 participants from, you know, law firms all over the world on this webinar. And we asked this very question about, you know, first question, we asked, uh, to what extent is cross-selling and collaboration a priority at your firm? And on a scale of one to five, we mostly got threes, but, you know, a fair number of fours and fives as well. So firms recognize that, you know, it's important for the lawyers to institutionalize their clients. Those clients become more profitable for the firm. And the more things that we're able to do with a client, obviously, the more we can bill them, the more we can become uh, instrumental to their success, the more we have that trusted advisor relationship with them as a firm. Uh, but of course, as you point out, many lawyers who don't necessarily have that team-oriented mindset are reluctant to do so because it, they fear that it's going to hurt the portability of their book of business. Uh, and then, of course, there's just the trust issue. You know, if there's somebody at my firm who I don't have a lot of trust in their competence or 
if I just think they're going to try to steal my client or what have you, I'm going to be reluctant to bring them in and cross sell uh, my my client over to their practice area. So there is this inherent tension that can often occur, even though firms uh, have the right rhetoric. They they prioritize collaboration as being something that's important. That you know we really want to be doing more of this. We should be doing more of this. And I think the key to moving this needle, you know, I think there are some lawyers who simply are not a great fit for the collaborative model. And it's important for firms to recognize that. And no matter how hard we push that agenda, they're never really going to. Uh, step in line with it. And and that's okay, right? To the extent that your firm's culture will allow for some variety there, then there, there, it's not necessarily good or bad to cross-sell. Um, but there is something to be said for sort of, do you, you know, do you want to really play the long game and create uh, a family uh, at your firm and uh, maximize the potential of your, your client base? Or do you want to play more of a short game where you're kind of hoarding these relationships and you have, you still leave the back door open if you ever want to bounce away to some other firm? Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's important that the firm puts forward uh, the right culture that really suggests that collaboration isn't just uh, something that we talk about, but something that we really mean. And we're here to support the lawyer in opening up their trusting nature, if you will, with the firm and with their colleagues and that we're going to look out for them. And I think it's also important for firms to put initiatives in place that assist a collaborative mindset to be engendered among the partners. Uh, so, you know, that has to do with compensation, that has to do with creating uh, social bridges that go beyond just the annual boondoggle where we all go to a golf course and get drunk and call it a retreat. Um, <laughs> but to really, you know, create those alliances within the firm so that people can start to make decisions, not just based on the firm's strategy, but based on the relationships, you know, again, that goes back to the sociability factor, the relationships that they have at the firm. You know, Joe, if you and I are at the same firm and you've become a good friend and I've gotten to the point where I trust you, then of course I'm going to bring you in on this or that matter simply because I know you'll have my back. But if I don't trust you uh, and I'm a little bit skeptical in terms of my own nature anyway, and the firm tells me I should cross sell with you, I'm going to have a pretty good excuse for why now's not the time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it seems a very, a very delicate, um, a very delicate line, uh, and I could see how people really have to. I, I I guess it's that firms really have to sell their their partners on the idea that they aren't trying to screw them over. Uh, is really the nice way uh, of saying it, I guess. Um, because no, I think that's right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's it right. blunt, but yeah. And it's no, no, no. You you, uh, you look. I mean, you you cut to the chase with that, and yeah. I do think <laughs> that um, compensation can really help or hinder that process. Because if you're sending a mixed message where comp doesn't really reward collaboration meaningfully, then of course people are going to serve their self-interest and they're just going to uh, you know, bill on their own clients and look at that short-term reward and call it a day. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's very interesting always to get into these, these sorts of questions. I, uh, you know, I, I've talked before. I I do some consulting with uh, people who are trying to lateral, and yeah, it um it, it's always a concern: is how much is this firm going to support me and be a platform that allows me to grow, versus how much are they going to just nab my portfolio the second I set foot there and uh, leave me now kind of beholden to them and unable to move in the future if something goes wrong, and it's. It's very delicate, and it, it, from my experience, it really is the firms that do the best are the ones who can, because everyone's pushing cross-promotion, really. I mean, they, they get the value of it, but it's the ones who can, I, you use the word meaningfully, and I think that's right, like can meaningfully communicate that I do think this is important and not because I'm trying to take money out of your pocket, but because I think we can all survive and thrive. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that at the end of the day, it's a mutual trust fall when done well, where both parties mm -hmm. just choose to lean into it and hold for the possibility that it's going to work out. Uh, that's when it works well. 
Uh, obviously, you know, they can look for signs that they may have to pivot that position. But if this is a, I'm not going to tip my hand until you tip yours kind of a dynamic, right. uh, the whole process takes a long time and one or the other party is going to run out of patience. Well, thank you for joining today. So David Ackert from the Market Leaders Podcast, where else can people find you? Well, you've got writing places and so on. Sure. Well, we uh, author a lot of uh, uh, research on a variety of business development oriented topics. You can download our white papers at Ackert Inc. So that's A-C-K-E-R-T-I-N-C.com. You'll also find an overview of our various coaching and training programs and our software platforms all at AckertInc.com. And if you are, uh, if you do have the bandwidth for one more podcast yeah. uh, in your life, then certainly you can uh, find us where wherever you listen to podcasts at the Market Leaders Podcast. And you know, I've been hearing, uh, I, I did a con little virtual conference uh, a little while ago, and one of the takeaways that we got from it was that more people are taking on more podcasts. I, for me, it's been a little bit more difficult because I always listened during my commute, so I don't have that anymore. So it's been more difficult. But apparently, according to the survey we had, more people are taking on more podcasts in this era, so... You I know. certainly have been. I'm, yeah. I'm taking these daily walks, which is a luxury I never gave myself before COVID. And uh, uh, part of how I fill my time is listening to podcasts, among them yours. Well, there you go. So, um, yeah, so it's this is the time. Uh, so that's another podcast uh, for you to add to your queue. And so thank you all for listening. Uh, you should be subscribing to these podcasts, giving them some reviews, not just stars, but also writing some stuff about them to help us with the algorithms that dominate our lives. You should be reading Above the Law, as always. You should follow. I'm at uh, Joseph Patrice on Twitter. Uh, you should listen to the other shows in the LTN network uh, and the Jabot, which Catherine Rubino, who occasionally is here as a co-host, hosts. Uh, and with all of that, thanks also to Logical for sponsoring and we will uh, check in with you again next week. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.